Okay, uh, we'll get this meeting started. Um, as always, there's a sign-in sheet going around. Please make sure that you sign in so that your support administrator doesn't get an email that you missed it when you're actually here. Um, everyone should have the slides of the PowerPoint that we're going to go over. Uh, Lauren has a stack. If you didn't get that handout, um, you can grab one from Lauren. Uh, so, um, before I get into the PowerPoint, uh, which is um, about promotional activities. First, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about um, promotional activities as a lead-in to the slideshow, I guess. Uh, the slideshow um, is a slideshow prepared by the NCA that they give. Um, it's got some case studies in it that'll help you see some situational analysis um, and go over the rules of promotional activities. Um, but the biggest thing uh, beyond that in-depth analysis uh, is just the simple concept of always ask before you act. Something I say every time that I get a group of student athletes together, it's always something that I say. Um, it's something that I say to you as coaches multiple times throughout the year, so you hear it all the time. It's really important to remember to ask before you act, um, which is not just a matter of to make sure what you're doing is permissible or not. It's also because certain things actually need approval. So even though it might be completely permissible, you might know it's completely permissible, you also have to go through the approval process. This is particularly relevant to promotional activities uh, because three different approvals are needed by NCA legislation having nothing to do with St. Francis policies for a promotional activity to occur. Um, those approvals are the student athlete themselves must attest to the fact that they're abiding by the promotional activity rules, a representative from whoever is being promoted or gaining benefit from the student athletes uh, activity must, and then there must be athletic department signature by someone approved by the director of athletics, which of course in most cases would be me signing off on it. Um, so that's actually NCA legislation. Um, so uh, I think everyone knows that the big impetus of how this came to point as a point of emphasis for this meeting is Potato Fest, uh, but I don't want those of you coaches who have never done anything with Potato Fest or you know, you're know you in fall championships so you don't even have time to think about Potato Fest to think that you can shut your minds off because just about every coaching staff, maybe every coaching staff in my time here um, has had some issue with promotional activities, whether it was Potato Fest with a group of coaches or some other promotional activity where we didn't go through the process correctly. Um, so uh, it's really important um, that we do go through the process uh, that you know to get the approvals that need to be done. Um, I'm going to start with Potato Fest by saying that um, Lisa has advised us not to write up any violations for anything in years past, so that should be a relief for some of you out there. It was a relief for me and Erica and us and the compliance staff, certainly, because we know that we've had violations in the past with Potato Fest. And that's independent of the interpretation of if we are allowed to go or not. That goes back to the strict, no interpretation, straight legislation that approvals were necessary and coaches went without those approvals. Um, so uh, that was a problem. So when I found out this year about coaches uh, who planned on bringing teams out to Potato Fest to do promotional activities there, um, you know, I'll go through the timeline of that a little bit, uh, but you know, it wasn't until Thursday, with Potato Fest being Saturday, uh, that I first had it come across my desk as something for me to even look into. Um, then it became apparent very quickly that it was something that had been done in years past without ever coming across my desk, which was an indication, first of all, that the approval process never went through, so we had committed violations in the past. Before those violations could be processed, that needed to be taken to determine, was this something that was otherwise permissible, we just didn't go through the procedure process, which is still a violation, or is it a violation in that we were doing something impermissible? Also, I needed to figure that out very quickly, because I needed to figure out, again, on Thursday, if Saturday we could be engaging in the activities. So, um, I guess, First of all, it's disappointing and I guess exasperating is a word to be um, put in that situation so frequently of um, this kind of time crunch. So uh, on Thursday, um, you know, 
making some phone calls, figuring out what exactly our student athletes are doing, what have they done in the past, um, what organizations are setting this all up. Um, and what became apparent to me uh, through the phone calls is that there's an organization called the Evansburg Main Street Partnership. Now, this was something I had never heard of. Um, in all indications, nobody had ever heard of such a partnership. It was just this general idea everyone had that we were just going to help out at the potato fest. Um, but the booth that would be helping out would be the Evansburg Main Street Partnership booth. But first of all, that's something you as coaches should know. Um, you should know if you're sending your student athletes to do something, what you're actually sending them to do, who's actually going to benefit from it. Um, so this was on Thursday that I found this out. Didn't find out if Evansburg Main Street Partnership was registered as a nonprofit or not. It was actually unclear even if it was considered a municipal entity um, of Evansburg or a private entity or if it was one of the kind of blurred lines um, and that could be kind of both. So with that information, we got the interpretation Friday morning um, that we could not have student athletes at a promotional activity representing the university. That was Thursday morning. There was still more work to be done. That was Friday morning. More work to be done, more for me to find out. This is one of those situations where given more time, I wouldn't have even conveyed that information to everyone. I would have continued working behind the scenes to try to clear it up. But given that I didn't find out until Thursday, because no one submitted approvals until Thursday, now it's Friday morning, and I get a, based on the information at the time, no, I needed to convey that to everyone. Which of course set off as expected. A whole lot of running around, a lot of problems, a lot of streaming, a lot of, you know, world is going to end scenarios on Friday. I um, need to get more information. Um, ultimately, uh, we were able to determine that the Evansburg Main Street Partnership is registered as a not-for-profit, um, but there are a couple of published NCA interpretations from the past cited for why we still should not have student athletes representing <coughs> the university. Um, volunteering with Edinburgh Main Street Partnership if they're at the university. Um, those interpretations basically came down to, um, there was one interpretation that was about uh, a city wanting to use the student athletes, men's basketball student athletes at the universities within that city in city promotions. Um, and even though that's obviously a municipality, the city uh, it was considered comparable to the commercial interests of the city. Um, so that they kind of saw that as the Evansburg Main Street Partnership, even being nonprofit, possibly being a municipality, is ultimately for promoting the business interests and commercial interests of Evansburg. Uh, the other interpretation, we had a nonprofit sugar lobby. And I'm really curious in this interpretation how they actually even wanted to use student athletes, but that's not really the point. The nonprofit sugar lobby wanted to use student athletes' names and images in a promotion. Even though it was nonprofit, it was determined that it clearly represented the commercial interests of a collection of sugar industry for profit companies. Um, so uh, it was considered not permissible. So, um, in short, the going forward is that uh, that is not something that our student athletes can do as student athletes. They certainly still have the opportunity as individuals, as they did this year, which was our solution that kind of saved us from just pulling everyone out, was saying anyone who wants to go is not going as a student athlete. They're going of their own volition, which they can still do in the future. Um, also, uh, need to make some distinctions. Uh, certain things, uh, when we allowed people doing strictly setup and cleanup responsibilities, in most cases that would not fall into promotional activities legislation. Um, don't want to make the blanket statement, blanket statement that it never would, because there could be scenarios where someone is doing cleanup and being recognized as student athletes for doing cleanup. That wasn't the case at Potato Fest. Um, they weren't interacting with the public, the public in this case being the people attending Potato Fest, the people who could potentially spend money. It was only those setting up Potato Fest who saw them and interacted with them behind the scenes. So that was not considered a promotional activity. Um, so again, in the future, it, not necessarily Potato Fest, but if there's an activity where your team is going to help with the setup or 
the cleanup after an event. Um, it probably won't be a promotional activity, but please do ask before you act. Because if there's any chance that the organizers of the activity are at any a point going to announce thanks to the St. Francis whatever team for setting up this whole display and, and getting it going, then it becomes a promotional activity. Even though the student athletes might not even be there anymore, they might have set up and left. Just that announcement makes it a promotional activity. Um, so do please ask before you act. Um, give me an opportunity to interact, communicate with the people organizing, whatever the activity may be. Go over it. In most cases, they'll have no familiarity with NCA legislation, and so that's where I can help them out. Um, ultimately, what it all comes down to is that the compliance office, all of you should view, the same way I tell student athletes, as a resource for you. Um, I can't help you with things that I don't know about. Uh, you just doing things and then it coming to my attention, it puts us in a much worse situation. Um, even if everything ends up fine, it, the fact that it's already happened or the fact that I find out when something's about to happen makes that priority number one, which throws off my whole planning of what I need to get done in what time frame um, and all of us in compliance. So it is really important um, to follow procedures, uh, to make sure we're doing things the right way. Um, and you know, make sure that give me an opportunity to help you uh, and don't put me in difficult situations. So um, with that being said, before I get into this power, this PowerPoint, a lot of what it's going to do, like I said, is case studies. It will help you to understand which situations are permissible or not. But I want to be clear, before I even give this PowerPoint, that's not the point because that's not your job, really. Um, Ultimately, yeah, the more work you do, the more you can find out. If you can verify to me that something is a nonprofit beforehand, yeah, that saves me some work because you presented it to me. But I have no problem if you come to me with very little information, but way in advance and say, this is just something, just an idea, and I'll look into it. Um, so it's not your responsibility to find out what is and is not permissible. It's your responsibility to communicate with me early, and often and allow us to figure out what is permissible or not. Yes? Have you communicated with the festival committee or with the Main Street partnership that we're not permitted to do this anymore so that next year, come this time, we're not getting emails asking us to? Or um, you know, has someone you know, communicated the NCAA rules with them? We have communicated with them and okay. certainly as it gets closer next year, we'll continue to be in communication with them. Um, and uh, you know, something they can do, and I'm not sure exactly how they've approached it in the past, but if they could just do a general call for St. Francis students and not direct it to the athletic department, then, like I said, our student athletes, everyone who wanted to do it, can still do it through the same channels that they asked for St. Francis students, and they are St. Francis students. So they can go ahead and do it, and they'll get all the same people helping out. Yes? Kevin, it seems to me like that would be more beneficial if we were telling them what we can do versus what we can't do. Because if you can say, right, I mean, because when you say what we can do, there are some things that we can, and all of a sudden, you know, that group organization can say, okay, hey, here's what we know of St. Francis, or their athletics, or whatever, they can do, let's gear it towards that. So I feel like a lot of the stuff we do is always, we can't, but rather than, how can we do it? Mm -hmm. yeah, we have there's a possibility. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, I think, certainly, Anyone who works in compliance doesn't do it because we want to be the person saying no all the time. Yeah. We, we want to get our brains working and find solutions. That's what draws us to compliance. So uh, I think a lot of times what it comes down to with the, uh, the way you perceive it comes down to what I was talking about. It's just a time frame issue. You know, given a shorter time frame, it's always going to be easier in a shorter time frame to say no. But given more time, it's like, like Rory just said, now we have a whole year until next year, so we can figure out a lot of solutions between now and next year. Between Thursday and Friday, and this becoming my entire Thursday and Friday, when I had a lot of other things to do Thursday and Friday, there wasn't all that much I could do. But ultimately, we did get it done where I said all student athletes, if you're going, you're going on your own, you're not going as student athletes. So. And I hate to say that ask you to do this because I know you're busy, but you're probably the only one that understands the rules well enough. Is there a way that you could work with the festival committee or the partner, the Main Street Partnership, to figure out something we can do next year so that when we get these emails, they have a whole year to reformat where St. Francis students can go, in particular athletic students can go? 
Yeah, yeah, okay. certainly. I mean, part of my position is working with constituents outside the university as well as our constituents within the university. So um, certainly, you know, they, it's a big, Edmondsburg as a community is a big support for us and it's important that we maintain relationships with them. And that's, that is part of my job. Okay, on to the slideshow. Okay, so this is the main part of promotional activities. Um, there will be a few slides later on about the other, but this is bylaw 12.5 in your rule book. Um, it's the one that most often is referenced in promotional activities um, about institutional, charitable, education, or nonprofit promotions. Um, so uh, a, a student athlete's, all of this is in reference to a student athlete's name or image or appearance being used. Uh, so it uh, can be used by the member institution. So St. Francis can use the student athlete's name or image to advance our causes. The Conference of the Northeast Conference can use it. Um, any recognized institutional entity. Um, a lot of times this would be like fraternity sororities partnering with student athletes or um, using student athletes or any other uh, recognized entity of the institution. Um, a non-institutional charity a non-institutional educational entity, or in some but not all cases, non-profit agencies. Um, those are the people who can use. Um, so the way that they can use the student athlete's name, image, appearance, um, is specifically for charitable or educational activities, um, not you know just saying, uh, well, we're a non-profit, but we're going to use their name for commercial purposes, um, actually supporting the mission of the charity or educational initiatives or any activities considered incidental to student athletes' participation in intercollegiate athletics. Um, this would be something like our auction, you know, using uh, student athlete images that's incidental to their participation is our fundraising efforts for the uh, department. <coughs> Okay, so the conditions, as we went over, written approval from the director of athletics or the designee, not a coach. A coach cannot give written approval, so in most cases it's going to be me, it's going to come through my office. Um, you know, any of us in the compliance office do have authority to sign off. Of course, <coughs> Mr. Kermel himself can sign off, so you have multiple people depending on who's available. Again, the more time you give, the less problems you're going to run into with people not being available. Um, if a commercial entity's trademark is used, then it must be just their regular registered trademark. So that would be something like, um, you know, doing something with the American Red Cross, that's a nonprofit, that's something that certainly our student athletes can support using their name, image, um, to support the American Red Cross. American Red Cross has a lot of corporate sponsors as well and ties to them. If it's an activity that a student athlete is engaging in, then the only corporate involvement can be their logo, logo being produced. Um, so otherwise it becomes co-sponsorship, uh, which we think the next slide get into. Um, okay, so we'll get into it in a couple of slides anyway. Um, the student athlete may not miss class time for any promotional activities. Uh, all monies derived, if there are any, must go directly to the institution, the conference, or the other one of the permissible entities, the educational institution, um, or a charity. Um, student athlete may accept actual and necessary expenses to participate in the event. This, in most cases, would just be transportation, maybe a meal as well, if that is an actual and necessary expense. So something like um, doing an activity, appearing at an event from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that three hour time frame, doesn't justify a meal. That's not an actual expense at that point because they can eat lunch before they go, they can eat dinner and they get back. Now there are whole day events or things that would encompass, they need to eat and they can be fed and receive that expense, um, but um, no compensation, no uh, actual monies beyond Necessary expenses. 
um, the restrictions on the sale of commercial items. Um, so if it's not an informational item, then it cannot be sold for sale with a single student This goes back uh, to the auction again. This is where a common one is something like a signed jersey or a signed picture, even like a signed ball. If it's only signed by one student athlete, then it's considered a single student athlete being represented and is in violation of this file right here. This is why you need things like team signed balls, or like a picture of the whole team. You can't have a student athlete with eligibility remaining. You know, maybe they're your star and they made a great play and someone got a great picture of them making that great play. You can't sell that until their eligibility has expired. Um, that's, but with multiple student athletes, then they can be sold. Um, with the caveat that it must be sold by institutionally controlled outlets. So that's things like at our auction, it's allowed. Um, it, they uh, can't be sold without being institutionally controlled. Um, this is the other two signatures I talked about in addition to compliance, signing off on any promotional activity. Uh, the student athlete must sign off and a representative um, of the organization that's using them. We're going to skip that for a little. Okay, so into case study number one. So a student athlete's former high school has requested permission to use a picture of a student athlete signing his national letter of intent. Um, and they want to use it uh, in a campaign um, to boost enrollment numbers. So it's going to basically be a admissions <coughs> office. You know, likely this is a private school trying to boost admission. They're going to, in their packet, showing probably success of former students show that someone signed a student, uh, a student athlete signed a Division I by their attendant is now out of Division I institution. So can this photo be used in the campaign? Anyone, any thoughts? Yes. No. You think it could not be used? Yeah. Why not? The school could have been financial. Okay. Increasing Okay. Well, yes. you're going to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> What's your reason? Because of all the money is going to the high school. Okay. So well, the answer is problem. yes. And kind of a mix of what both of you said. Yes. Um, <coughs> yes. The Institution is the only one benefit. There's no commercial agency benefiting in this case. Um, with the money being generated, they're being indirectly generated. So they could not take that picture. The education, the, the high school could not take that picture and sell it at a school fundraiser. That would be a sale where they're directly deriving funds. And that would be the answer would be no. But using the image to boost enrollment, which ultimately leads to more revenue generation, is permissible in this situation. Um, you know, noting that, of course, they make a point of pointing out that provided the criteria of 12.511 are met, which more than anything else means provided all of the approval signatures are signed. Uh, can the student be wear the apparel? Yes, there are no limitations. Are there limitations on where these advertisements can be displayed to promote the high school? No. No limitations within current legislation. But All right. Let's switch high school off to club team. Like, so a lot of us recruit kids from big club teams. Can they use that? Most likely not. Okay. Um, the, the key in this was that it was an educational, um, and in the first one of the first slides it said, the institution, the our conference, educational or charity organizations can. Um, so this fit into educational. Um, that if it's a non-scholastic team and you remove that educational component, then if you're probably not going to meet the legislation. Hey Kevin, if, um, if they have a picture, a club team has a picture and say, you know, this, this 
uh, athlete is committed to so and so school. Is that okay or not? Um, in most cases, that would be considered a press release. So that's fine. Yeah, if it's if it's considered informational. So, in in most cases, that would be perfectly fine. Um, so an institution um, wanted to put up a billboard, so they asked the MCA, would they be able to, wanted to get an interpretation. Um, it's a current student athlete, uh, and so they want to congratulate that student athlete for getting player of the week honors. Um, so is this one permissible? So we're saying yes because we already know that big schools do it. Um, the answer is yes, it is permissible. Again, they make a point of stating every time to remind you, provided all of the provisions are met, this should trigger in your head, provided you get all three signatures you have to get before it happens. Okay. Getting interesting with this one. So, um, there's a local PGA golf tournament, and the institution um, is going to uh, has purchased a tent to host some of their big donors at this big golf event. Um, and they want to have student athletes make an appearance there, where all the donors are there, to uh, you know really connect their big boosters with their student athletes. Um, and then the secondary point is that before the student athletes can come to this tent that's set up, they actually need to have a ticket to even get into the PGA Tour event first. So is this one going to be permissible? So you're saying it depends how they get their ticket to get in in the first place? That's a question. Okay. <laughs> Anyone have any thoughts on that? That could potentially make a difference, but it doesn't make a difference because ultimately what they're doing there is they're not promoting the PGA Tour. And the PGA Tour isn't saying, they're not putting any advertisements out that say, student athletes are gonna be here. They're just promoting their professional golfers. Once the student athletes are there, the only people who are gonna know that student athletes are there are the people in this specific tent. So what the student athletes are doing is actually promoting the institution, even though it's at a PGA Tour event. So this is falls into that institutional, the first category, um, of the permissible ones promoting the institution's interests um, because they're promoting donors uh, trying to get, you know, pr improve relationships with donors of the institution. And then, interestingly, the ticket into the PGA Tour event can be covered by the institution because that is an actual and necessary expense in order for them to engage in this promotional activity. So, because the student athletes couldn't possibly, if the PGA Tour had set it up where there was some way where, you know, security could escort them into the tent and back and that's all they could do and they weren't allowed to go to the greens and watch play, then they couldn't, the institution couldn't also buy tickets for them because that wouldn't be necessary to do the promotional activity. But because the ticket itself is necessary to do the promotional activity, it can be paid for at an actual and necessary expense. It's okay that we've served there? Yes. Interacting with the yes, students. because they are enrolled student athletes. We would run into issues if they were if they wanted to bring prospective student athletes there. Because even if it was an official visit and within their mileage and within the cost to bring the student athletes there and they want to show off that the PGA Tour comes to town, you know, we're in a good location, but they couldn't have the PSAs interacting with boosters. So that would be an issue. Okay. 
Um, now, so let's talk about when there is a commercial location in use or a commercial sponsor of the event that's not for commercial purposes. Um, so activities are allowed to occur at a commercial location provided that that commercial entity is not a co-sponsor of the event, so just their space is being used, but they're not co-sponsoring the event, and the student athlete doesn't promote the sale of any of the commercial entity's products while they're doing that. Um, so the way it's permissible, a lot of times, just to give you a, a real basic example, is um, you know doing a car wash in the parking lot of you know whatever name a big box store that has a huge parking lot. Um, then it's really not encouraging anyone to go into the store. A lot of times you could be on the far end of the parking lot, not even really close to the store, where it's really easy for people to pull off the road, get their car washed, get back on the road, and not even shop at the location. And the location is not um, advertising that this is going on, um, so they're not a co-sponsor, so that's permissible. So let's look at case studies to see if they meet the legislation. So at the IHOP Annual National Pancake Day. IHOP, um, if you're not familiar with this promotion, it's a big IHOP promotion every year where they give free pancakes, but then you're expected to make a donation of any amount of your choosing <coughs> to a charity that IHOP has chosen. Um, so a local IHOP, you know, close to an institution, wants student athletes um, to show up, you know, just volunteer the time, make an appearance, and then they think that it'll drive up business because more people, in addition to wanting to go and get free pancakes, in addition to wanting to support the charity, they'll see an opportunity to, you know, maybe meet and greet with some big name student athletes. So uh, that's what IHOP has requested of you, the coaches. So um, is it going to be permissible for the student athletes to go do this? Eric Long says no. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, no. Yes, no. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> okay. Well, Coach Long is correct. Um, the restaurant is clearly co-sponsoring this event, um, so it's not permissible. So um, the institution has scheduled cards, you know, printed up um, that they want to get out into the public anyway. So uh, Dunkin' Donuts says, why don't you have your student athletes giving them out here? You know, maybe the institution has first said, Dunkin' Donuts, can we put a stack of cards there? And they said, why don't you come down and hand them out? Um, so the way that this actually ends up working logistically um, is that the coaches and student athletes stand at the end of the line. Um, and then uh, hand them out along with the food being served. They, maybe they just stuff them into each bag that, that Dunkin' Donuts is giving out, um, or maybe they physically hand them hand to hand. Either way, it's, uh, uh, and the goal of the institution, the stated goal, is to get people to attend their home games by getting a schedule card in their hand. Now they know the game times. Maybe they've met an athlete or a coach at Dunkin' Donuts and feel compelled to come out and check a game out. So uh, is this a permissible arrangement. The coach is just for athletes, no? Okay, Rory says the coaches can do it, but it's not permissible for student athletes. I said, yeah, it's like the car wash, right? Just using their facility. Okay, so we've got a yes for student athletes, a no for student athletes. The answer is no. Um, because this is uh, tied to the sale, because the way it specifically was set up that it was at point of sale that they got the schedule cards. So like the car wash example, if they had set up a table in the parking lot and were handing out uh, cards to people, that would be perfectly fine because no sale is necessary. Someone could come, take a card, and decide they don't want anything at Dunkin' Donuts and leave. In the way it actually was presented, someone who walked into Dunkin' Donuts and then decided they didn't want to buy anything never got handed the card so the sale itself was necessary to get the card, so it became co-sponsorship at that point, where Dunkin' Donuts was benefiting as well with the sales. And the coaches can't do that either? 
Well, the coaches can do it, yeah. Everything we're talking about is from a student athlete perspective. So, so yeah, the coaches could be doing that. Um, Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to finish the slideshow from this point. Um, you have all the slides. The reason being the rest, the media activities and the uh, continuation of appearances uh, after enrollment that had begun before enrollment, um, things like that are much more rare than the ones that we already presented. So. They do still happen. For your information, you should read through the slideshow. Um, see if you can answer the questions. If you want to talk to me, you know, if you're unsure of the answers when you're doing the later key studies, if you want to talk to me about it, it's great. Um, but I'm not going to take the time to go through the rest of this slideshow. Um, so uh, I'm going to let, uh, well, first, are there any more questions about any promotional activities? Uh, anything that we want to clear it up? Or just points you want to make. All of that would be with, with promotional, not community service, correct? Yes. Okay. This comes. That's actually. I'm glad you said that. This comes up a lot. Coaches asking what's the difference between community service and promotional activities. NCA legislation doesn't touch on the term community service. Now, most of the time, a community service activity will be a promotional activity, but that's not always the case. You know, for example, talking about those set up, those clean up duties where they're doing it, the student athletes are doing it for the organization, but nobody knows that the student athletes are doing it. Um, so that's not considered a promotional activity. Um, you know, so there can be plenty of other scenarios where student athletes can be doing it, but nobody knows that they're student athletes and then they're just doing community service. But Anytime the organization acknowledges or we acknowledge that our student athletes are doing that, or they make it clear that they are student athletes in view of the general public, um, then it becomes a promotional activity. Okay? All right. I'm um, going to let Lauren speak. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to discuss briefly the website called FanPay. You should have all received an email from Mr. Criminal um, about this website. Has anyone seen the website at all or know anything about it other than the email that you received? No? Okay, I'll um, just discuss what it is. FanPay is a website that's set up to enable fans to donate to a team or a specific student athlete um, so they can collect this money after their eligibility. Um, the website's still in very early stages, um, so right now any money that's donated has been done by the developers of the website and it's fake money, it's not actually real yet and the website hasn't gone live. Um, clearly this is an impermissible activity um, and to kind of go along with promotional activities, the use of the student athlete images um, is also impermissible, but what's been, been done right now has been done without the consent of any student athletes. Um, so the NCAA is aware of this, also the NEC, and they've been working with their legal counsel um, to take measures necessary to deal with this. Um, and what you need to know, basically, is if anyone says anything to you about it or questions you about it, if your student athletes ask you about it, you just need to tell them um, that the NCAA is looking into it, that it is impermissible. Um, and also that your student-athletes should know that it's not live at the moment and that the NCAA is working so it won't affect their eligibility at all um, or impact them. Does anybody have any questions about the website at all? Warren, has that been sent out to the all student-athletes as well? Or just coaches? Or we um, I think at this all? point it's only been sent out to all of you. Um, I, I don't think that the student-athletes are aware of it um, right now. Um, like I said, it's in very early stages, but they wanted to take the measures to educate everybody on it. Anybody have any questions? No. Can no. Thank you, Lauren. Okay. Oh. Um, <laughs> okay, um, for the IRL, okay, very important. 
if you need to add anyone to the IRL, please email me. All I need is if you do have their ID, um, NCAA ID number, that's the easiest way I can add them. But if you don't, just provide me with their full name, um, where they're from, and um, high school. And I can just add them. It's like one, two, three. Just send me an email. I'll add them. I'll respond and let you know that they're added. If you need an update on your IRL, it's easy for me to just get it and I'll just email to you. But um, for those that you have recruited, like incoming freshmen, um, it's better to put them on the IRL as um, early as possible. But for the um, for initial eligibility and amateurism, they need to be certified. So for those that are recruited, there's a temporary um, certification period that they have. And if they're not certified in both of those, the amateurism and the initial eligibility, they won't be allowed to practice until they're certified. So um, also for ones that are just trying out, they need to be on the IRL too. And they will be added to the roster, but if they don't make the team, we can take them off the roster. But they need to be on the IRL. Um, and also, if you have an athlete that hasn't been, if you have an athlete that hasn't been certified yet, please, like, we're gonna keep you updated. But please, like, um, also um, keep up to date with them because we have so much going on. And we can sometimes, you know, might pass by it. You know, we have other things going on in the office. It's pretty busy. So just keep on top of your athletes. It'll make it much easier. And uh, it won't lead to any problems. But also, some coaches, they have the choice. Um, well, some coaches won't allow any of their athletes to practice or do anything until all certifications are complete. But you have the choice to let them practice. But if you don't, it prevents the potential problems and makes life easier on us. And um, anything else, just please send me an email. It's so much easier just to do that. And also with official visits, um, what is it? The, the request form at the bottom with the meal tickets, it says like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can actually type in the athlete's name or their parents' name, whoever's going to like have a meal ticket at Torbian or anything like that, instead of putting the amount of people like five, because then it'll save me time of emailing you and asking you, oh, who would you like on the meal ticket? I can actually see the names. <coughs> it seems like it's small, but I, I can actually zoom in probably like at 200 but I can see it <laughs> when I do that but it makes life much easier and for me so any other questions what official news or anything is the uh, the list for the names of the people attending the meals is that on the request or the reconciliation the request okay yeah because the um, reconciliation form is actually supposed to be submitted after the visit because of things change you can just put it on there and also, please, I know a lot of coaches have been on top of it, like with the official visits, but please have them in at a, like, as early as possible. Like, give me some time, at least a week, because sometimes you might have, like, eight in, and I have to do all these goals with all the official visits and make sure that all the classes, especially with the NCAA, that they're matching with the, um, the transcript evaluation and things like that. If I have to call the high school to verify something, it gives me time to do that. And also with the hotels, um, please let me know about that, about trade or anything like that. I can call ahead of time. Anything else? Sorry, any questions? No? Okay, thank you. Okay, last agenda item. Um, I want to talk about the sale of apparel. So um, as Everyone should know at this point. Um, right now, the bookstore is the only authorized seller to the general public for anything St. Francis. Um, we do get exceptions for specific cases, um, for usually for specific events where through Jim's office, something can be set up where either Jim selling or you as a coach can sell you know, with going through Jim to get approval. Um, but as you know, uh, the bookstore is the only authorized seller to the general public. 
Um, since we in athletics cannot make sales to the general public, we cannot make sales to prospective student athletes or their families. Um, this is because it would become preferential treatment, because we'd be selling them something that's not available for sale to the general public. And due to our institutional policies, it cannot be available for sale to the general public, because the bookstore has that monopoly. Um, so, furthermore, uh, if we get to a point where we are allowed to make team sales, um, if, so if we do end up that through any uh, you know, deal we might be making in the future, um, it's uh, important to know that sales to prospective student athletes or anyone with a prospective student athlete must be at the advertised price, not at cost to us. Um, that's not, so cost to us is not the standard for what something needs to be sold for. Um, it, so uh, for a prospective student athlete, it would need to be whatever the advertised price is so that uh, we don't get into preferential treatment or, uh, for them. Um, but the big thing is right now it can't be done anyway because of the bookstore. So any questions about that? What about me? Immigrant is completely different. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, you know what immigrant is and is not allowed to sell. Um, and when dealing with prospective student athletes and their parents, obviously don't cut them any deals. Yeah, right, right. Just sell it at the advertisements. Any other questions? Okay, any general compliance questions while you've got your entire compliance staff here available to you today? Is, is that a potential way around that with uh, working through Derek, though? Can we have him make an order through Immigrant <laughs> Oh, boy. I mean, if, if you want to sell gear with the, uh, you know, SFU soccer uh, seal, I doubt it would be approved to be sold through Immigrant. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, if you, <laughs> if, if, if he has, if he has better general gear than the bookstore has, you can certainly suggest to your prospective student athletes to check out Immigrant, and even though most of it's going to be golf specific, if he has some general Red Flash or SFU stuff, yeah, certainly they can go there to, to buy things. Kevin, is there any way, like, obviously, it sounds like coaches want to be able to sell gear, like soccer, or whatever. Is there any way we can get them to the bookstore so they will sell it? Like, who's, is that Jim who has to help? That would be Jim, and he's, he's tried, and they're, you know, they're, they're concerned. It's, it's all a numbers game for them. If they, you know, if they can buy a few hundred things that just say SFU or just say SFU Athletics, then they can buy a few hundred at a time and feel like they can sell them, whereas they feel like if they're only going to sell five to ten items that say SFU Women's Basketball a year, they're not going to put an order in for that little amount of items. That's that's what their response is. So I know this is probably a gym question, but maybe that's something that we install at, at Stokes as a, a team shop that has yeah. athletic gear for, and, right, because everybody's yeah. asking for and it, so we're all trying right. to find ways to do it's it. It's a gym question, so I can't, can't answer it. <laughs> Yes, um, is there a way that we can maybe get an email or something that says the compliance meeting dates for the next like couple months just with like planning practices and individuals and stuff like that? I don't know if you already have it. Yeah, sure. Okay. I can email that. It's generally the second Wednesday of the month. Okay. So but I'll email it out anyway because okay. if it's shift of the week or month, then I'll email it out so that okay. everyone you. has it. Anything else? Okay, thank you for your time.